It's the video we've all been waiting for, my queer analysis of 1989, Taylor's version. I did one of these videos, or two videos, I should say it's two-parter for Midnight a few months ago, and you guys really, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed making it, and 1989 is one of my favourite albums of all time. When it came out in 2014, it was such a sort of pivotal time in my life and my sort of journey within myself, my coming out journey, realising who I was, and I just played this album on repeat again and again and again because I felt so seen by it. I know the public perception of Taylor Swift is that she is a straight woman, but there's something about the lyrics, the words within these songs, which made them relatable to me, a lesbian. I am now out as a lesbian woman, a queer woman. I have so much to say about this album, so no doubt this is gonna be a very long video. I'm gonna have to film it over a number of days. But before I get into it, I do just want to preface this video with some things about queerness, queer culture, and queerness in relation specifically to Taylor Swift and her songs. In doing this analysis of 1989, I am not saying that Taylor Swift is 100% a queer woman. Like, that is not what the purpose of this is. In doing this analysis, I am saying... I am a queer woman, a lesbian woman, and here is how I read and understand her music. Here is what her music is saying to me. Here is how I see the world, and that is reflected in the way that I perceive art. Speculation about somebody's sexuality is a sort of morally neutral act. Like, it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing. It is just a fact of life. Every day when you go out in the world, you are seeing people and assuming you are straight. Like the majority of people you are going to look at and think that is a straight person. Unless there's specific flagging things that suggest to you otherwise. And queer flagging is such an important thing when it comes to the queer community. Because for so long, for centuries, for decades, queer people have had to hide who they are. Still today, so many queer people feel the need to hide who they truly are. But you also have this human need to want to connect to other people in your community, to want to fall in love, meet people who are like you, be in relationships. And so to do so, the queer community has to flag to other queer people that this is who they are. Like, I am queer, I want you to know because you are also queer, but I don't want the rest of the world to be able to perceive that that is who I am. And there are like myriad ways that people have done this throughout history. This isn't a history lesson, I don't have time to go through it all with you. But for example, during Oscar Wilde's era back in the 1800s, I think Oscar Wilde was around, that might be wrong. But he made it popular to wear a green carnation on your lapel if you were gay. So if you were out in this time, you saw a man wearing a green carnation, you could know that he was queer, but the rest of society wouldn't know what that meant. More recently in history, you've got things like bandanas. People would tie bandanas around their belt or around their bag or just around some part of them and different colour bandanas sort of flagged different things to the queer community, whether you had a specific kink, whether you were looking for a specific type of person and then the rest of the community would know whether it was safe or not to approach you. Ways of flagging nowadays for specifically queer women might be Short nails, short, clean nails is quite an important one. It might be certain haircuts, certain styles of clothing. For decades, Doc Martin shoes, they were a big signifier that somebody might be a lesbian. Nowadays, that is less applicable because obviously everyone loves and wears Doc Martins, but for many years, that was a signifier. I say all of this to say that looking out for other people flagging that they might be queer is something very inherently natural to queer people. And when people see or hear Taylor Swift's songs and think that she is flagging, it's not an inherently negative thing. It's not an insult to think that she might be trying to say something to a certain group of people. Seeing flagging within songs is something that is only meant to be seen by queer people. It's meant to be that straight people hear this and don't think anything of it. Taylor Swift may or may not be doing this intentionally. There is no way of knowing, but that is why queer people may read into it the way they do. If you are offended over the thought of somebody being gay or offended over people speculating that somebody might be gay, that is because you place negativity on that idea. Being queer is not a negative thing. Maybe think to yourself, why do you think that it is? If you're offended, why are you offended? It's not a bad thing to think somebody could be queer. And I use the word could because we don't know anything. Like the whole world presumes that Taylor Swift is straight and she may well be, 
But it's not a negative thing to think that she could be queer, especially when so many of her songs, especially from like Folklore, Evermore, Midnight, are so inherently queer coded. And hopefully you can listen to my analysis in this video and hear what I am hearing as a queer woman. And we are going to start with the opening song of 1989 and that is Welcome to New York. For all of my analysis here, we're very much gonna draw on my knowledge, my nerdiness around queer history. It is just my bread and butter, I love it so much. And New York is obviously a very important place for queer rights, for gay rights. It is the birthplace, the modern birthplace of queer rights as we know them today. I um, mean, in June 1969, a raid was held in a bar called Stonewall in the West Village in New York City. And raids were something that happened quite a lot. Gay bars were illegal. And a lot of the gay bars at the time were owned by the mafia. And a lot of the time, if the mafia knew that a, or basically the mafia would be tipped off by the police that a raid was happening. Only on this night, the raid wasn't done by the local precinct. I think it was the sixth precinct, but correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember exactly. But instead the raid was held by like the general overarching New York police. So the mafia didn't get their usual tip off. They could have warned people the police were about to come, tell people to disperse. So the police come in and raid the place. And there was this rule at the time that you had to be wearing a specific amount of like gender approved clothing. Um, because that was one of the main indicators that somebody may be gay or not. If you were a woman and you were wearing trousers and like male clothing, you're a lesbian. If you're a man and you were wearing women's clothing, you were a gay man. Like that is how it was like seen. Obviously I'm not shelling here, like massively. This is a huge, like intricate piece of history. Um, so the police come into Stonewall and they take anyone who isn't wearing the most, the sort of gender approved clothing and put them in a closet at the back of the inn, which is really ironic. They're searching these people, they're questioning these people. And at the same time, the crowd out the front of Stonewall have kind of had enough. Like for a long time, the gay community were really, really beaten down by the police. And, I, and I'm saying gay community here, a lot of these people were actually trans, but at this time they didn't have the sort of terminology to know that people were trans. Like they knew that some men dressed up as women, but they didn't have like the knowledge and the understanding that we do now. So at the time it was just the gay movement, the gay community. And on this particular day in June, 1969, the patrons of the Stonewall Inn had decided that they had had enough. They were going to fight back for really one of the first times ever. Like obviously there had been sort of riots throughout the USA, throughout the world, in the sort of like decade leading up to this or a couple of decades leading up to this. But Stonewall, it was the hairpin drop heard around the world. Like this was the moment. So people fought back and thus was the birth of the gay rights movement. The next year there was the Pride Parade, the first ever Pride Parade in New York City in 1970. And over coming years that would spread around the world. And here we are today in the UK, gay marriage has now been legalized and that brings me around full circle in my story because I am engaged to my fiance, my female fiance. And where did we get engaged, you might ask? We got engaged out the front of the Stonewall Inn. It comes full circle. Which again brings us back around to Welcome to New York, New York City, inherently a very gay place, very, very important to the LGBTQ plus community. So, walking through a crowd, the village is aglow, the village obviously referring to the West Village, the gay village, that is where Stonewall Inn is, it is also where Taylor lived at this time on Cornelia Street. Um, kaleidoscope of Loud, so Kaleidoscope obviously are an arrange, arrange? array is where I was going with that, an array of colours, which again, obvious queer connotations. And also the use of the word loud here as well, like that makes me think of You Need to Calm Down, which is literally Taylor's like gay anthem song. That song is about gay rights, like nobody can argue with that. Um, the lyrics are, you're being too loud, like you're being too loud about your gayness. A lot of people, gay people are accused all the time of, you're being too loud. Why must you talk about being gay all the time? Like you're rubbing it in our faces when in actuality we're just, being the same as straight people are, but straight people don't notice when other straight people are talking about their straight partners, but they do notice when people are talking about being gay. Heartbeats under coats, everybody here wanted something more, searching for a sound we hadn't heard before. So Taylor is in New York, searching for something new. Everyone is in New York, searching for new experiences. It is such a wonderful, vibrant city. New York is like my favorite place in the world if you're new here. I love New York City so much. If I was a millionaire, I would be living there. I'm not a millionaire. I can't afford to live in New York, but I would love to. 
Um, so she's searching for maybe new experiences. Um, welcome to New York. I've been waiting for you. Obviously, we know New York. Gay. Inherently gay. <laughs> it's a new soundtrack. I could dance to this beat. New soundtrack. Again, new experiences. Trying new things. Um, if you sort of see this song in terms of like a gay awakening, I probably should have said that at the beginning. Like the way I'm analysing this song is through the lens of like this being a gay awakening. I'm not saying that is why Taylor wrote it. I'm not saying that's her intention behind the song. I'm saying that's how I, as a lesbian woman, perceive the song. I hate that I have to do so many disclaimers, but I said disclaimers weird then. So many disclaimers, but I have to. People on the internet are crazy. <laughs> When we first dropped our bags on apartment floors, took our broken hearts, put them in a drawer, everybody here was someone else before, and you can want who you want, boys and boys, and girls and girls. I don't really need to do too much explanation there, but I'm going to. So Taylor's moved to New York City, she's like recovering from a heartbreak, and she's put it in a drawer, and she's like, no, we're moving on, we're going out, we're having fun. Um, is she wanting to meet somebody new? Maybe. Um, everybody here was someone else before. So in New York City, you can be yourself, you can find your new identity. It's all about finding yourself, which is something that I really inherently feel when I'm in New York City. I feel like I'm very much a different person, living a different life. I feel so free there, which is wild. Um, I just love, I love, love, love wandering around the West Village, seeing all the pride flags, going into all the gay bars, and just like being with my people. And like Taylor living in the West Village really would have been surrounded by queer people. Like it is such an inherently queer place. And you can want who you want, boys and boys, and girls and girls. Do I need to give any further explanation there? Like this is literally Taylor saying, you can want who you want, boys and boys and girls and girls. Like nobody cares here, like this is acceptable. And this was like really, really brave of Taylor at this point. She was still sort of like, this was her first pop album coming off of country. Um, and obviously being a country artist, she had a lot of very conservative fans. She still has a lot of very conservative fans. That's how she made her name in the first place. So coming out with her first like solid pop album, I know like Red, it like Verge, but like 1989 was like the first pop. Um, so this was like brave of her to be like her opening song on her first pop album and saying like boys and boys and girls and girls like it is fine I'm fine with that you should be fine with that New York City is fine with that like this whole song to me it just reads like a queer awakening and it is wonderful um, I've been waiting for you, maybe like she's been waiting for something new and exciting to happen in her life and it's happening in New York like any great love, it keeps you guessing. Like any real love, it's ever changing. Like any true love, it drives you crazy. But you know you wouldn't change anything, anything, which I don't think is particularly queer, but I just love that because it just summarizes how I personally feel about New York City. That is like my great love. Somebody asked me like what my great love in life is. It's New York City. Moving on next to Blank Space, which is one of the cleverest songs I think that Taylor has ever written. I'm just gonna like read from my notes here because I've written like pages and pages and pages of notes for this video <laughs> and I'm gonna use them. Um, so this is a satirical song about how Taylor is perceived by the public or through the media. It reads to me, if we're looking at it through a queer lens, maybe about PR relationships and bearding. But basically Taylor has this very public persona, like how the media perceives her. She is a man eater, she destroys all these men, she dates them then dumps them then moves on, like she's a slut, all this stuff. Um, so Taylor wrote a song about that. She wrote a song about the public persona that she sees, or like persona in the media because she said it was so weird because it was so different from who she is as a person. So she wrote a song about the person the media thinks she is and it's so clever. Um, but if you're looking at it through a queer lens, it could very much be about like PR relationships and bearding. So the song starts out with nice to meet you, where you been, which is obviously a very nice greeting. She is meeting somebody for the first time. She is bringing them into her life. I could show you incredible things. Magic, madness, heaven, sin. Sin is obviously quite relevant when it comes to the queer community it is very much seen as a sin we are told it's a sin all the time saw you there and i thought oh my god look at that face you look like my next mistake loves a game wanna play so she sees love at this point as a game or like she thinks the media no wait how do i word this the media thinks that she thinks loves a game so she's saying like do you want to play like let's do something fun with this like let's have a fun time. If they think I think love's a game, then we're gonna do this. 
New money, suit and tie, I can read you like a magazine, ain't it funny, rumours fly, and I know you heard about me. This, I think, is so interesting. I My annotation here is just rubbish. So what rumours have these people heard about her? Like, again, if we're thinking about it in a queer context, could it be potential rumours about her being queer? Around this time, she was very close with Diana Agron, Agron, I never quite know how to say her surname, and there were so many rumours that she was dating Diana at this time. Whether they're true or not, I can't say. I can show you the evidence, I can tell you the evidence, but we, nobody knows for sure, so like this video isn't gonna be about speculating on Taylor's specific relationships, it's just gonna be talking about them in general. But this time there were rumours flying around that Taylor was dating Diana Agron, and could these rumours she's talking about be these rumours, the rumours that she is queer? Um, so rumours fly and I know you heard about me, so let's be friends, which I find really, really interesting. So this is about, like, the media thinking that Taylor is a man, man-eater and she dates all these people. So she's approaching somebody new and she's saying, hi, let's have some fun, let's do this. Ain't it funny, rumours fly and I know you heard about me, so hey, let's be friends. Not lovers, it's let's be friends, which is so interesting if you're thinking about it in terms of a bearding context. Is Taylor publicly in a relationship with a man to cover the rumours about her being gay, which is literally what a beard is. It is a opposite sex partner, so you can live your gay life without anybody on the outside knowing. At this time, in the lead up to 1989, the famous relationship that she was in was with Harry Styles. And so many people think a lot of this album is about Harry Styles. It is interesting to me, by the way, that it's fine to speculate about her songs being about men. It's not fine to speculate about them being about women. Which seems like a double standard. Just saying. Um, but, like, Harry Styles was the main face, the main, like, boyfriend of Taylor's in the lead up to 1989. So maybe her and Harry were just friends. Again, speculation. I don't know, you don't know, nobody knows, apart from Taylor Swift herself. Um, but I just thought that was really, really interesting. Dying to see how this one ends, which kind of sounds like sarcastic, doesn't it? Like, oh, I'm dying to see how this one ends, but like she knows it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, grab your passport and my hand. I can make the bad guys good for a weekend. So again, it's about her, she can like rehabilitate the bad guy image, like she has, I have no doubt she's been in PR relationships before, like every celebrity has been in a PR relationship at some point, I am sure. Um, so is Taylor maybe paired with the bad boys to rehabilitate their images? So it's gonna be forever or it's gonna go down in flames. You can tell me when it's over, which again, very much reads bearding or PR relationship, like all the other person has to do is be like, oh yeah, I'm done now. And then there's like, no beef, it's fine. Like just move on, like just tell me. Um, you can tell me when it's over if the high was worth the pain. So I suppose in conjunction with the next sentence, maybe that doesn't quite make sense, but we're doing it line by line, it's fine. Um, if the high was worth the pain, got a long list of ex-lovers, they'll tell you I'm insane. Cause you know, I love the players and you love the game. So again, this is Taylor being ironic. She's like, this is what the media think of me. So I'm gonna pretend to be that person. Um, cause we're young and we're reckless, we'll take this way too far, it will leave you breathless or with a nasty scar. Got a long list of ex-lovers, they'll tell you I'm insane, but I've got a blank space baby and I'll write your name. Blank space, I've always wondered, could that be like a contract? Like, she's got a contract and she's writing their name on the contract? Maybe, don't know. Oh, also, I've just seen in my notes, I wrote for the previous verse, cause you know I love the players and you love the game. Um, so I've written, it reminds listener that they don't actually know anything, which again is really important in the context of this video. We as listeners, we don't know anything about Taylor, about her personal life. We know what she chooses to put out to the media. Everything Taylor does is PR driven. Anything we read in the papers is because Taylor's publicist has put it there. And that is so important to remember, not just with Taylor, but with celebrities in general. It is so interesting to speculate, but we only know what they tell us. Cherry lips, crystal skies, I could show you incredible things. There's something about the use of cherries in songs which are just so inherently queer. Again, referring back to my notes. Um, a double cherry is very much a pseudonym. Is pseudonym the right word? I don't think that's the right word, but I can't think what the word I'm going for is. It's a code name, I suppose, for lesbians. So if somebody says somebody's a double cherry, that means they are a lesbian. 
Like the imagery of Cherry is used in so many queer songs. You've got I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry and the Cherry Chapstick. You've got the song Cherry by Fletcher and Hayley Kyoko. You've got Girls, Girls, Girls by Fletcher, which I literally just wrote Girls, Girls, Girls. Oh, yeah. I was like, what was the context of that? Um, Girls, Girls, Girls by Fletcher is inspired, or is sampled, sorry, I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry. Um, and it's just like the actual lesbian version of I Kissed a Girl. And there's a line in Girls, 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 which is, I sipped her like an old fashioned, which Fletcher has literally said is inspired by Taylor Swift because Fletcher saw Taylor Swift at an award show and Taylor was drinking an old fashioned cocktail and Fletcher said it was just the sexiest thing ever. So when she came to writing Girls, 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 she drew on that experience. I sipped her like an old fashioned. So gay. <laughs> Stolen Kisses, Pretty Lies, You're the King Baby, I'm Your Queen, which is so funny because that is just like so unlike Taylor. There's something I can't like fully grasp why, but there's just something about that line like Taylor today would never write that. Um, find out what you want, be that girl for a month, wait the worst is yet to come. Find out what you want, be that girl for a month. So again, if you're thinking about PR relationships, she is finding out what it is they want out of her. She's going to be that for a month. Then she's going to dip and move on because this is just a contract between two people. Screaming, crying, perfect storms. I can make all the tables turn. Rose garden filled with thorns. Hear me out on this one. This might be a stretch, but there's something about roses, which is such an inherently straight flower. Like you have all these different flowers within sort of like queer history, queer culture, which are known to be like gay flowers, like gay signifiers. Again, we go back to the queer flagging. People would wear or reference these flowers all the time. So other people knew that they were gay. Like Sappho wrote a lot about violets and violets became a symbol of lesbianism. Then you've got lavender. So you've got the lavender scare. Um, just lavender is really, really linked with homosexuality. You've got carnations, like I mentioned earlier, with Oscar Wilde. I just dropped my phone, sorry if that was a loud noise for earphone users. Carnations, Oscar Wilde, very gay. Roses feel really, really straight to me, and that is a personal opinion, but roses are straight. But then you've got roses filled with thorns. So yes, it's straight, but it's dangerous. Keep you second guessing, like, oh my God, who is she? I get drunk on jealousy, but you'll come back each time you leave because darling, I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream. When this song came out, irrelevant to queerness, but just a point, because darling, I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream, was that not the like title on every single person's Tumblr pages? Every person, every person loved that line. Um, so it's gonna be forever, it's gonna go down in flames, blah, blah, blah. I think that is pretty much it's just repeated towards the end. Um, boys only say they want love if it's torture. Don't say I didn't, say I didn't warn ya. Again, like, love shouldn't be torture. You're doing it wrong. If love is hard, you are doing it wrong. Um, like, people love to romanticize the idea of like relationships being really hard and having to like really fight for each other. I personally don't believe that's what a relationship should be. Like, if you are fighting that hard to stay together, it's not meant to be. Move on, it's not working. But that is like such a, straight way of thinking like obviously generalizing but within the queer community it's very much people communicate better I feel again generalization don't come for me I suppose I should be specifying I'm talking about personal experience and lesbian relationships here but there's better communication better handle on emotions and so relationships can be less painful when they get torturous they do end lesbian relationships when they end all they end and they end disastrously but they end when they need to. Found out the other day, there's a really high rate of lesbian divorces, and this could be for so many different reasons, but it's actually speculated that it's not because lesbians are unhappier more than straight couples or gay couples, it's actually because lesbians have a better handle in their relationships, so when they are unhappy in a relationship, they're more willing to leave it than just live in a miserable relationship, whereas straight people are much more likely to stay just for the convenience of it and because that's kind of what's expected societally, whereas there's no expectation of that on lesbians, which I found really interesting. And gay men, if they do get married, they're less likely to get married, but if they do get married, they're more likely to stay together longer than anyone else. Fascinating. And with that, let's move on to our next song, which again, I think is about bearding or a PR relationship. They're very, they feel very intertwined to me. And that is 
Style. So according to my notes, Style is another song about bearding, widely considered to be about Harry Styles, but they were actually barely linked. Like Taylor and Harry were not together for very long and there's very, very few actual photos of them out in the wild, I should say. People love the idea of Taylor and Harry because they are both these like global mega superstars. Like I love the idea of Taylor and Harry. Like I love that. If they were to get together now, I would freaking love it. Like I am not a Taylor and Harry hater at all. I love the idea of it. I just don't believe that their relationship actually happened. I think it was a PR stunt, which breaks my heart because I do want to believe in it. It worked out for her that Taylor could then write a song called Style, which may well be about somebody else entirely, but just happens to make obvious references to Harry Styles. Just saying. Um, Harry Styles is also widely considered to be queer, and he's actually much more open, kind of, in a way, about his queerness than Taylor. Um, he's said before that he's never felt the need to label his sexuality, but he very often waves pride flags around on stage. He does it on the weekly basis. Um, Taylor flags much more subtly, whereas Harry will literally have a pride flag or a bisexual flag on stage talking about queerness. I've seen Harry Styles three times. He's done it at every single concert. Some people say that it is just him trying to like benefit of the queer community. I can't tell you that for sure. All I can tell you is I believe it. I believe it if somebody tell tells me that Harry Styles is a queer man. So whilst Harry Styles parades around the stage waving a pride flag talking about queerness, Taylor Swift might, I don't know, maybe in some world somewhere might have her lighting on her very famous world tour be that of the lesbian flag colours. Or she might upload a music video where she is wearing a wig with the bisexual flag colours. Maybe. She might. I don't know. Midnight, you come and pick me up, no headlights, long drive, could end in burning flames or paradise, which really sort of like calls back, I think, to blank space. It's talking about this relationship, it's either gonna end amazingly or awful. To me, again, it sounds like this is a pre-planned ending. It's gonna either end in burning flames or paradise. It depends how the media wants to spin it. Um, fade into view, it's been a while since I've even heard from you. So this is somebody who is kind of in and out of her life. Um, I should just tell you to leave because I know exactly where it leads, but I watch us go round and round each time. Again, that very much could be a beading or PR relationship. You know what's going to happen. You come together, you get a few photos, people talk about it. You are, you've covered each other's backs for a while. Let's go on with our life. Again, I can also see this genuinely being a song about somebody that she has a relationship with. Like I'm not an idiot. Um, you got that James Dean daydream look in your eye and I got that red lip classic thing that you like. James Dean is a really interesting reference to make here because James Dean was famously a bisexual man. Like that is not argued with, like he is famously bisexual. His famous quote when he was asked whether or not he was gay was, no, I'm not homosexual, but I'm also not gonna go through life with one hand tied behind my back. Um, obviously, James Dean was around in a time where it wasn't safe to just go out and be like, I'm homosexual, I'm bisexual. I don't even know if bisexual was necessarily a word really used in this time, but he notably had a whole load of lovers of different genders. Elizabeth Taylor came out and said that James Dean was gay. You got that long hair, slicked back, white t-shirt. Long hair? Like, I know men can have long hair, but also long hair, woman. Also, long hair being slicked back is very much a queer flagging thing that is very that's a very gay way to have your hair um and i got that good girl faith and a tight little skirt and when we go crashing down we come back every time so we never go out of style we never go out of style i feel like i could do a really good dramatic reading of taylor swift songs crashing down we come back every time again i've written it could be a reference to bearding or pr it's very easy to bring back around if things go wrong so it goes, he can't keep his wild eyes on the road, takes me home. So it goes is actually a song on Taylor's next album, Reputation. And so it goes just happens to be one of Taylor's just gayest songs ever. It is so lesbian. <laughs> Lights are off, he's taking off his coat. I say, I heard that you've been out and about with some other girl. He says, what you've heard is true, but I can't stop thinking about you and I. I said, I've been there too a few times. This is a really interesting look at perspective because it very much depends how you understand this sort of like bunch of lyrics. 
Um, but when I hear, I said I've been there too a few times, I compare that back to, I heard that you've been out and about with some other girl. And then Taylor's like, I've been there too a few times. I've also been out and about with girls sometimes. Or it could just be like, oh yeah, I've been out and about with other people in general. Like I've also like cheated or like I've been not entirely faithful. Um, maybe, I just, just, that's how I read it. But it just doesn't really make sense with the previous line. What you've heard is true, but I can't stop thinking about you. And she says, I've been there too a few times. So is it that she can't stop thinking about him? But that, that sounds weird. That isn't how like a conversation would go. And then it's just the same lyrics repeated. This is something that she does a lot in like 1989 particularly. Like I know it's very much an awful thing that you repeat lyrics towards the end of a song. But in 1989, the same lyrics are repeated like so many times. <laughs> that is not a read on Taylor's songwriting skills, by the way. Like I die on the hill that she is this century's William Shakespeare. I, I will die for that. Moving on to Out of the Woods, talking about repeating the same lyrics again and again and again. <laughs> this is a prime example. Um, looking at it now, it all seems so simple. We were lying on your couch. I remember you took a Polaroid of us, then discovered the rest of the world was black and white, but we were in screaming colour. The rest of the world was black and white, but we were in screaming colour. I remember having this same discussion when I was talking about Midnight. There's very, there's some sort of reference to Grey. What song is it? I can't remember, but there's like grey versus like a rainbow, which very much quite obviously could be interpreted as black and white, grey being heterosexuality and screaming colour, the rainbow being the queer community, being LGBTQ+. Like to me, that is so obvious. You've got the black and white expected relationship and then you've got this other relationship which is screaming in colour it's prideful, it's exciting, there's so much happening and it makes sense in this context that it could be a queer relationship. Again, I've said that Out of the Woods is sort of more bearding or maybe it's like making peace with your sexuality, maybe it's hiding, there are so many queer interpretations of this. Looking at it now, last December, we were built to fall apart, then fall back together. The use of the word built here is again, really interesting. Who is building this relationship? It sounds like it's being built from the outside. So the idea going into this relationship was they were built to sort of like fall apart, then fall back together. It was meant to be tumultuous maybe to keep the media interested in it, to keep them talking about this rather than the other things that Taylor might have been doing in her personal life. Like let's make this interesting as somebody from the outside sort of conducting all this. Um, the night we couldn't quite forget when we decided to move the furniture so we could dance, baby like we stood a chance, two paper airplanes flying. Um, again, the paper airplanes very much could refer to Harry Styles because the necklace she was seen wearing was a paper airplane necklace. Um, to move the furniture so we could dance, they'd be like we stood a chance. They knew this had a sort of time scale on it. They knew it was gonna end eventually. And I remember thinking, are we out of the woods yet? Are we in the clear yet? Again, are we out of the woods? Are we in the clear yet? It's very much about like, you're scared to come out, like you're scared of this relationship. Are we out of the woods yet? Are we safe to like be ourselves yet? Are we in the clear to come out and live our lives as we want to live it? My throat just cracked there, but I'm not saying it again. Um, can they come out yet? Can they come out of the woods yet? This whole song sort of like paints a picture of being trapped. They're trapped in this woods. And the idea of like being trapped or like locked in somewhere is very much the whole theme of Midnight's, as I said in my previous queer analysis of that. It's this feeling of like anxiousness, you're claustrophobic, you're sort of like stuck in this box that you can't escape out of, which is very much something that queer people can relate to for very obvious reasons. Remember when you hit the brakes too soon, 20 stitches in the hospital room, when you started crying, baby, I did too, but when the sun came up, I was looking at you. Remember when we couldn't take the heat, I walked out and said, I'm setting you free. Again, couldn't take the heat, setting you free, very much could be a contract. She is setting him free of this contract that he was in. Again, we are referring to Harry Styles. It's very well documented that they were in a snowmobile accident when they were together, so I don't think there's any denying this song is about Harry Styles, like that's not a question here, it is, but I question the legitimacy 
of that relationship like were they just friends to me this song does read as friends but also it does have that like underlying maybe on the surface it's about Harry Styles under the surface it's about something a lot deeper than that maybe with somebody else are we out of the woods yet are we in the clear yet like has my relationship this bearding relationship made it safe for us to be happy together next up we have the song that truly started me on my path to gaylorism and that is I wish you would to me this song is pretty explicit and there's one line in this if you probably know what I'm talking about there is one line in this which literally changed my life so I remember hearing it for the first time and being like hmm that's weird for a straight person to say but let's begin it's 2am in your car, windows down, you pass my street, the memories start. You say it's in the past, you drive straight ahead. You're thinking that I hate you now because you still don't know what I never said. So this is a relationship in which there are secrets. You're thinking that I hate you now because you still don't know what I never said. So Taylor is sort of like keeping secrets. She's holding things back from this person. This person thinks that they hate her but really she doesn't hate them. There's just some things that she hasn't told them, maybe can't tell them. Maybe again, if you're thinking in terms of like PR relationships and bearding, maybe she can't tell them that she is queer. The idea of keeping secrets is very inherently queer. I wish you would come back, which I'd never hung up the phone like I did. I wish you knew that, that I'd never forget you as long as I live. And I wish you were right here, right now. It's all good, I wish you would. I love the flow of the lyrics in this song. They just flow so nicely. It's such good songwriting. Again, not really too much queer to say about that, but I just, I love that verse. Um, it's 2am in my room, headlights past the window pane, I think of you. We're a crooked love in a straight line down. Let me say that again. We're a crooked love in a straight line down. That singular line changed my life. <laughs> Please tell me, a straight person explanation for we're a crooked love in a straight line down. Could this be about bearding? Two people who are crooked, which is often a word, like a kind of derogatory way to describe gay people, queer people, in a straight line down. Two people maybe bearding and pretending to be straight together. Or could this be referring to a potential gay lover? we're a cr crooked love in a straight world like we are queer together we are a unstraight love in a world which expects us to be straight i mean my personal interpretation of this song is it's about a relationship falling apart you are thinking about the regrets that you have around that relationship and the mistakes that were made you're reminiscing back on it and wishing you could have done things differently like i wish you would like i wish you would have done these things differently but i also wish i would have done these things differently makes you want to run and hide this is very much a common theme within queer literature the idea of hiding who you are hiding from straight society being closeted is being hidden I wish we could go back and remember what we were fighting for. Again, this is very much, if we are looking at it through a queer lens, I know there are a million ways to interpret this, we are looking at it through a queer lens. Remember what we were fighting for. There is so much to fight for in queer relationships. You are fighting for acceptance. You are fighting to be treated the same as your straight counterparts. There are so many people in my life who I would never ever describe as homophobic, who are nothing but supportive, but they still treat me and my fiance differently than they do our straight counterparts. And we are constantly fighting to be taken seriously because I feel like a lot of the time people, people feel more comfortable if they think of us as friends who live together rather than people in a romantic relationship. So we are always fighting for that equality, fighting to be fully accepted. People don't mean it in any particular way. They don't mean to be anything less than accepting, but it's just the way that you are conditioned in society. Like society is never gonna treat a gay couple the same way they do a straight couple. And that is just the horrible, horrible truth. There's this whole theme throughout this song of wishing you're wishing for things to be different. I spend a lot of my time wishing that the world was different. It's about having regrets. It's if you go back and do things differently, this is what you would do. This mad, mad love, could this be Taylor saying the world thinks our love is mad? I don't think it's mad, but like this mad, mad love. Also, it's very intense love potentially. Makes you come running to stand back where you stood. Again, she then repeats the we're a crooked love in a straight line down line. She feels very strongly. She wants people to hear this line. Um, makes you want to run and hide, but it made us turn right back around. 
Maybe this could be interpreted as a relationship where somebody is in the closet, like you're saying, I wish you would come out of the closet. I wish, I wish, I wish. But that person, for whatever reason, is not willing to do that. And so it obviously makes the relationship very, very difficult. Okay, it's a new day. We have a new piece of Taylor Swift inspired clothing. Last week I had the folklore cardigan. Today I have my Cornelia Street jumper. What will I have for the third part of this video? You'll have to wait and find out. We're gonna jump straight back in with Wildest Dreams. I wasn't actually gonna analyze this song because this has never really given me very many like queer vibes. Like when you're just listening to it at face value, just the vibes, they're just not there. However, when I looked at this for this analysis, I actually think I have quite a lot to say. And the first thing I want to say is the music video. The music video for Wildest Dreams is very old Hollywood. It's very reminiscent of Elizabeth Taylor. And Elizabeth Taylor was rumored for many, many years, still rumored today to be a queer woman in whatever capacity that is. And this is a rumor that has followed Elizabeth Taylor throughout her entire legacy and while she was alive as well. And I do find myself wondering if maybe Taylor was trying to draw some parallels there, maybe? I don't know, this is all speculation, but there's that. I'm not gonna go in depth speaking about every music video, obviously, because this video is already about 50 minutes long, I bet. Um, so we're gonna talk about the lyrics. So Wildest Dreams opens with, he said, let's get out of this town, drive out of the city, away from the crowds. So immediately Taylor is talking about escaping, which again is very much a theme that runs throughout Midnight. So it's one of the biggest themes, escaping, feeling trapped in a box, not wanting to be part of the life that you're currently living. And this perfectly encapsulates that. I thought heaven can't help me now, nothing lasts forever, but this is gonna take me down again religious imagery, Taylor is doing something that she sees as a sin, something that a god won't be able to forgive her for, and homosexuality is very much seen as a sin in the eyes of Christianity. Nothing lasts forever, but this is gonna take me down. So this is either a very, very intense relationship or something that Taylor is doing is going to maybe destroy her reputation, destroy her public persona. What she is currently doing is gonna take her down, gonna take everything down. Like that is really extreme to say. He's so tall and handsome as hell. He's so bad and he does it so well. She is using obviously male pronouns here. That's not gonna stop me guys. But it's the next line here that is really interesting to me. I can see the end as it begins. So again, this is maybe Taylor, if you think about it in terms of bearding, she already knows how this is gonna end because it is contractual. Like they've already laid out. I can see the end as it begins. And then we have my one condition is, so there is a condition to this relationship. Again, it very much makes you think of contractual relationships and PR. She has a condition. Um, say you'll remember me standing in a nice dress, staring at the sunset, babe, red lips and rosy cheeks. Say you'll see me again, even if it's just in your wildest dreams. So it certainly seems here like Taylor's saying like, we can't be together, so you've got to remember me in your dreams. Like, why can't Taylor be with this person? She's like, please just remember me, don't forget about me. And this is very reminiscent of Evelyn Hugo. I point back there because my Evelyn Hugo book is right there. And um, that very much feels like a sentence that would be in that book. Like, please move on, live your best life, but don't forget me. Like, remember me as I am right now. Um, again, Red Lips also is reminiscent of Evelyn Hugo. And after Maroon on Midnight, anything that evokes any sort of thought of Red Lips is now gay to me. Red Lips, so Scarlet, it was Maroon. I said, no one has to know what we do. So again, very much keeping secrets here. His hands are in my hair, his clothes are in my room, and his voice is a familiar sound. Nothing lasts forever, but this is getting good now. Honestly, I know if the Hetlers get a hold of this, they're gonna be like, it's male pronouns, it's male pronouns. Like, if queer people never saw, or like queer women, I should say, never saw any queerness in the use of he, him pronouns, so much queer literature would just go down the drain. Like, you can't take that to mean like, oh, this is exclusively about men, so I can't take it like personally at all. Because otherwise so much media is just like removed from our grasps. Like male pronouns don't really mean that much. And also, especially with Taylor, like I can't take any use of a pronoun seriously after, oh, what's the song? Wait. <laughs> the very first night, Taylor's version from the vault we have, 
because they don't know about the night in the hotel. They were riding in the car when we both fell. Didn't read the note on the Polaroid picture. They don't know how much I miss you. They don't know how much I miss her. Might make sense in that like rhyming couplet. But no, they don't know how much I miss you. It's almost like Taylor wanted to draw attention to the fact that this rhyme doesn't make sense. It's almost like Taylor is saying like, look how much I can play with my lyrics, with my words. Like none of it means anything. It doesn't have to mean what you think it means. I also do wonder about like the perspectives in this song as well, because Taylor seems to switch between like first person to third person here, like really abruptly. He's so tall and handsome as hell. He's so bad, but he does it so well. And when we've had our very last kiss, my last request is. So like, he's so tall, but we, do you get what I mean? Like in a narrative sense, it doesn't make sense. If anybody has a more succinct, more concise way to explain that in the comments, then please do it, because I feel like my brain is working away from me. I can't like quite grasp the point I'm trying to make here. Also earlier, I mentioned the red lips, but I didn't mention the sunset. Sunset is the lesbian flag colors. Sunset is very much the kind of theme of the era's tour. Like the coloring of the era's tour is again, lesbian flag colors, sunset colors. Also side note is gonna be the color theme of my wedding. If people outside ask, the color theme is sunset. If people like close to me ask, queer people ask, the color theme for our wedding is lesbian flag. <laughs> You'll see me in hindsight, tangled up with you all night, burning it down. So she is talking to a lover here. They're going their separate ways. She's like, you'll look back on this. You'll think about the nights that we spent together in bed, tangled up all night. And we were burning it down whilst we were doing that. Like we were burning down the public perception of who Taylor Swift is. And then towards the end of the song, Taylor kind of like adds this extra line, say you'll see me again, even if it's just pretend. So that again could hark back to PR, bearding, contractual relationships. But like at the very least, this song's about a relationship that can't happen unless it's in their wildest dreams, a relationship that can't be public, can't really, they can't go through with, but in their dreams they can. Like they wish this could happen, but it just, it can't for whatever reason that is. And then let's move on to How You Get The Girl, a song that Taylor Swift has written about how to get the girl, how to romance women, how to date women. It's almost as if she's got personal experience in the subject matter at hand. Like, let's say hypothetically that Taylor Swift is a woman-loving woman and she wanted to write a song about how to get girls. This is kind of the perfect way to do it. She does this a lot. She'll write a song using she, her pronouns, but it'll be like, it's from the male perspective. I'm writing from the perspective of a man. It's fine. Which, like, valid. May well be. As a queer person, it is so validating just when any woman is writing a song using she, her pronouns. Like, immediately... There's just this other layer of like re relatability. We've got, she'll open up the door and say, are you insane? We've got, remind her how it used to be when you left her all alone and never told her why. I just, it is like food for the soul. Really fun fact, out of all the songs on 1989, and we're not talking Taylor's version just yet because as I'm filming this, it is the 25th of October and Taylor's version doesn't come out for two days. So let's wait and see what those vault tracks are saying. But out of like the regular 1989, only four songs out of I think 17, maybe? I might have made that up. But only four songs on the album use he, him pronouns. Four, that's it. Everything else is very ambiguous. Those four are Style, Wildest Dreams, which obviously we've just discussed, New Romantics, and You Are In Love. And all of them use them in a really intriguing way. The gayest thing about the song is the fact that she is using she, her pronouns. Like the blatant use of she, her means that she has to hide things less. So whilst I'd usually go through this and be like, oh, like I can use this to explain away the he, him pronouns. Like I don't need to do it in this song because she is talking about a woman, like she is very openly talking about a woman. So there's not really loads I've got to say about this one. Um, she does use the words like insane and afraid, which is quite like, people use those words a lot when they're talking about queer people. Like they used to think that queer people were insane. 
Um, being afraid is a big theme with being gay. Like you're just constantly a little bit low level scared all the time. You're afraid to come out of the closet. You're just afraid to like be who you are to the world. Tell her how you must have lost your mind. Again, that is terminology that is used quite often when talking about the queer community. A lot of people are accused of like losing your mind. It is a mental illness. Like homosexuality is a mental illness. So losing your mind there is quite evocative. I do also want to point out that Taylor Swift sung How You Get The Girl on tour as one of her surprise songs on the year of set list during Lesbian Visibility Week. I'm just gonna leave that there to simmer. I Know Places is definitely one of my favourite songs on this album. I just think this song is so beautiful. But this is Taylor singing about a secret relationship once again for somebody who has a lot of very, very public relationships. Taylor Swift sure does love singing about secret relationships all the time. Constantly. All the time. <laughs> and this song to me very much incites the same sort of anxiety that you feel with Out of the Woods, the feeling of you're being caught out, the feeling of being trapped, you're stuck somewhere and you just like, you keep running but you're not really getting anywhere. And to me, I Know Places and Out of the Woods are so similar in that aspect. I even think the songs sound fairly similar. You stand with your hands on my waistline. It's a scene and we're out here in plain sight. I can hear them whisper as we pass by. It's a bad sign, bad sign. Now I think there's probably a couple of layers to analyze here. Um, being in plain sight is being out in public. Everyone can see you. Um, so here I think about Taylor maybe like walking down the street with a potential partner. It's a scene, there's paparazzi everywhere, people are trying to like get photos, trying to get her attention and we're out here in plain sight. So she is out in plain sight with somebody she's in a relationship with. But potentially it's only a rumour, people don't know for sure. So let's say maybe Diana Agron, she is walking down the street with Diana Agron. I can hear them whisper as we pass by, it's a bad sign, bad sign. So if you are in a relationship with somebody and you're trying to cover that up, trying to like, you want people to think you're friends so you can keep on having this undercover relationship, hearing them whisper as you pass by, it's a bad sign. Like that's not good, like people are beginning to like, think things are going on here, like rumours are beginning to start. Something happens when everybody finds out, see the vultures circling dark clouds. So when people find out about this relationship that she's having, something terrible is gonna happen. And the use of vultures here is very evocative of death, like vultures famously feed on dead carcasses of animals. So as soon as people find out about this relationship, the vultures are gonna come, they're going to basically destroy them from the inside. Love's a fragile little flame, it could burn out, it could burn out. So whoever she's in this relationship with, it's really fragile. Maybe this other person doesn't want the public to know this other person isn't ready to be out and proud. So as soon as it gets to that point, it's gonna burn out. Like this isn't gonna go any further. Cause they got the cages, they got the boxes and guns. They're the hunters, we are the foxes and we run. Cages, again, once again, very, very reminiscent of Midnight and her whole theme of like being trapped in a cage, being stuck in a box or maybe a closet. Um, people are trapping her, putting her in boxes. She feels like she's being hunted. Um, and, and again, she wants to run and hide. So she wants to run away from whatever's about to happen. She doesn't want people to find out. This whole song sort of uses the hunting metaphor, like Taylor feels that she is being hunted by the paparazzi, by the media. It's life or death, it's do or die. If she is caught on camera, I think the use of the word gun here is a metaphor for camera. If she is caught on camera, she is like life or death, like bad things are gonna happen. Baby, I know places we won't be found and they'll be chasing their tails trying to track us down because I know places we can hide. So she's basically talking about like me and you, whoever she's in this relationship with, like let's go and hide, nobody can find us in this place. Lights flash and we'll run for the fences. Let them say what they want, we won't hear it. So she's gone from the sort of like terror and fear in the first verse, so scared of being captured. Like she can hear whispers as they pass by. It's a bad sign, she's scared. And now in this second verse, she's very much like, well, defiance, let them say what they want. We won't hear it. Like we are stronger than this. It's very much like the five stages of grief. Seven stages of grief? however many stages of grief there are, like Taylor is working through it and she is getting stronger. Loose lips sink ships all the damn time, not this time. So here she is talking about rumors, rumors destroy things all the time. She's like, not this time, I'm not gonna let it destroy this. Um, just grab my hand and don't ever drop it, my love. They're the hunters and we're the foxes and we run. So again, it's this defiance. She's like, I'm not gonna let this beat us. 
baby I know places won't be found like the whole I know places like she's looking for a safe space and again safe spaces are very important to the queer community like we are constantly looking for safe spaces where we're surrounded by community and we're not in danger I think this whole song is very relatable to the queer community in that it talks about the fear the danger of being outside the danger of being perceived and being watched it's really scary I love how Taylor's getting stronger throughout this song like the fear is affecting her less in the last verse it's they take their shots but we're bulletproof so now she's like nothing they can do is going to affect this like we are bulletproof I know places and you know for me it's always you in the dead of night your eyes are so green at this point Taylor had two potential lovers who had green eyes she had the public lover of Harry Styles which again like I said in like earlier in the video very much may have been real I don't personally think it is but what does my personal opinion matter it doesn't really um but Harry Styles green eyes but also her rumoured lover Diana Agron also green eyes so it's like very clever of her to use that because she knows that people will assume it's about Harry Styles whereas it may not be and then we move on to Clean, which I think universally is a very beloved song. So I think this can kind of mean whatever you want it to mean. I think all music can mean whatever you want it to mean, but like Clean is applicable to so many emotional life situations. Um, and in my head, this song's always been really inherently queer. But reading through the lyrics, I'm not entirely sure why. I've just always been able to relate to it. So again, this analysis is just vibes it gives me <laughs> queer vibes that i can't explain this song is symbolic of an end of relationship self-discovery and healing like i said it can mean anything to different people some people take it literally as being clean from an addiction some people take it as being clean from a relationship i do think taylor herself was writing about the end of relationship and that sort of like the cleanse that you have where you like move on from this person you sort of like purge yourself of any connections to them and you sort of step out the other side and you feel like you can like breathe again the drought was the very worst when the flowers we'd grown together died of thirst it was months and months of back and forth you're still all over me like a wine stained dress i can't wear anymore so she's saying the hardest part of this relationship was kind of when it was beginning to end when the love, the life that they'd grown together started to wilt. And that is always really, really hard. Like when you're with somebody, when you have this idea of what your life is gonna be and all of a sudden it's gone, it's ended. Like that can be really hard to come to terms with. You're still all over me like a wine stained dress I can't wear anymore. Taylor sings about or writes about wine and some of her like most blatantly sapphic songs Think False God, Ivy, Dress, Willow, Maroon, August, Death by a Thousand Cuts, all make reference to wine, spilling wine, sipping wine. And I do wonder if she uses wine a lot as like a theme throughout all of her music for sex, for intimacy. And I don't know if in my head, wine automatically has sort of like this queer connection because of the Shit's Creek metaphor in which David Rose is basically like coming out to Stevie as bisexual, or no, pansexual he is, I think. And he says like, he likes red wine, he likes white wine, and he likes rose as well. Like he likes the wine, not the color of it. And so I think ever since then, wine has always been sort of like intertwined with queerness. But Taylor was singing about wine like long before that. Hung my head as I lost the war and the sky turned black like a perfect storm. Lost the war, again, talking about Midnight's, the Great War, like, immediately is very evocative of that. Um, it's just incredibly intense, like, she has lost the war, she has lost this relationship that she is trying to cleanse herself of now. It was really, really difficult, whatever it was. It's very clear in this song that her whole sense of being was very much tied up in this person that she was in a relationship with, and I think that's scary because whenever you're in a relationship with somebody like you kind of become one like you can try and be individual as much as you want and that is something that me and my partner my fiance really strive for like we still want to be individuals we don't want to be like a couple but inherently like you are going to be thought of as one like you come as a pair the water filled my lungs i screamed so loud but no one heard a thing for me this is very much about feeling like unseen feeling invisible i remember when i personally was closeted i just wanted to like scream it from the rooftop and be like i am gay like somebody like recognized this within me somebody asked me like something like it was so 
isolating and so horrible because I wanted to be, like I wanted to be who I was so badly, but just saying the words was so difficult. Like I literally found it impossible, but at the same time I wanted to like scream it from a rooftop. And it was a real like journey for me coming to like be comfortable with saying the words. And now it's like, it's like once I said it, the floodgates opened, which is also quite relevant with clean. And it was easy. All it took was that just like one time. So Taylor was like, I screamed so loud, but no one heard a thing. Like I'm screaming this at the top of my lungs. And why is nobody noticing? Could it be her being like, I'm putting it in my music. Like I'm making it so clear that I'm queer, but why is nobody seeing it? Cause I can't actually come out. This really does link to you need to calm down from lover, which some people do theorize as part of Taylor's like failed coming out era, but the lyrics in you need to calm down and literally you need to calm down, you're being too loud. With the lines like 10 months sober, I must admit, just because you're clean don't mean you don't miss it. I do wonder if that could refer to queerness, so she is now out of this queer relationship. She is like trying to like go cold turkey and like not be queer anymore because it's not like viable with her public persona, but she misses it. Like just because you're clean of this relationship of whatever this was, doesn't mean you don't miss it. And now that I'm clean, I'm never gonna risk it. So again, now that she's clean, is she never gonna risk coming out? Is she never gonna risk being in another queer relationship? Like she's washed herself clean of that like era, so she's just not gonna risk it again, which we may theorize she did risk it again. <laughs> and now we move on to the three songs that were only on the deluxe version of 1989. And I truly believe that Taylor saved the most blatantly queer songs for the deluxe version only. Like these songs are so gay. And we're gonna start with my favorite Taylor Swift song of all time, maybe one of my favorite songs of all time, full stop, Wonderland. First up, I would be doing a disservice to this song if I didn't reference the cover shoot that Taylor did for the magazine Wonderland, in which she is boyfriend Taylor looking like a lesbian woman. The hair slicked back, the black and white, so gay for Wonderland magazine. The lore with this song goes so deep and I'm gonna have to try and do my best to analyze this without referencing too much Taylor's like rumored relationships, but I might reference it a little bit because it is, it's kind of relevant or, or quite relevant. Um, So Wonderland is obviously inspired by Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland from 1865. Um, and I have a really fun fact for you, a queer history fun fact for you about Alice in Wonderland, because it is this book which actually popularised the word queer. Before like Alice in Wonderland, the word queer just like wasn't really used, but it's used so much in this book. I've written in my notes here, Lewis Carroll uses it multiple times, literally he uses the word queer in every single chapter to represent the odd incidents that occur in Wonderland, like the differences between Wonderland and real life. And a lot of queer people can very much relate to this, like the feeling of not belonging anywhere. Flashing lights and we took a wrong turn and we fell down a rabbit hole. This is Taylor falling into a relationship that she shouldn't have been in. She is literally describing she took a wrong turn, she fell down a rabbit hole. She took a wrong turn and she fell somewhere that she shouldn't be, but somehow she's ended up here. It's maybe about a mistake, a friendship that's become more, which is very gay. Also gay, wrong turn. A lot of people think that being gay is wrong. She took a wrong turn. You held on tight to me because nothing's as it seems and spinning out of control. That feeling of your first queer relationship, that feeling when you're discovering who you are, you do feel like you're spinning out of control, like you can't control what's happening to you. It's scary and the world is just like turned on its head. Didn't they tell us don't rush into things? Didn't you flash your green eyes at me? Haven't you heard what becomes of curious minds? So don't rush into things is something I think probably a lot of queer people have heard. This is definitely something that I heard when I was coming out. It's like, oh, it's a phase. Like, don't rush into things. Like, be careful. Like, you don't really know what you're feeling. There's like very much a invalidation when you're queer. Like, people are always telling you like, oh no, you're wrong. It's just a phase. Don't worry, you'll get over it. Like, it's just this one person. Like apart from this one person, you're definitely straight, right? Like, don't rush into a relationship because you'd never know. Um, didn't you flash your green eyes at me again? Green eyes. That is a running theme throughout 1989. Harry Styles versus Dan Agron. 
Haven't you heard what becomes of curious minds? A line so queer, so gay, that I actually think I'm going to get it tattooed on my body. That is not me over-exaggerating. I'm literally going to get the words curious minds tattooed here, I think. I'm still pondering, but I think I'm going to do it. Um, this line, where do I even begin? I've written in my notes here, it screams to me of a first proper sort of like foray into gayness. It's all like very new and exciting, like you've never done these things before, like it's scary, but it's fun. You're just like really curious about everything. Um, but of course, as you'll see in the rest of the song, it has the usual crashing down, as tends to happen in a lot of relationships. But the words like curious minds have so many layers, like Taylor's saying like, haven't you heard what becomes of curious minds? Like she is experimenting, she is stepping outside of the heteronormative box that society has put her in. I think curiosity is such an important part of being human. And I think it's such an important part of being queer because you've got to sort of like cut down or like push down all those walls that society have tried to like box you in. You really have got to be like curious enough to like look beyond those walls. And I just love this line so much. Haven't you heard what becomes of curious minds? And also it's kind of like a threat, isn't it? Like, haven't you heard what becomes of curious minds? Like bad things happen if you're curious. That's kind of what society tells you. Bad things happen if you step outside of this heteronormative box. I keep referencing apparently. Um, but it's like, it's not enough to stop you. Like you're curious, you're gonna do it anyway. This song just screams to me of like your first proper foray into like queerness, into gayness, into like exploring that area of yourself. Didn't it all seem new and exciting? I felt your arms twisting around me. I should have slept with one eye open at night. So again, is her usual like, this is all gonna come crashing down around me. And we found Wonderland, you and I got lost in it and we pretended it could last forever. And life was never worse, but never better. This is so like multifaceted. This is Taylor being like, this is the best that my life has ever been. Like, this is so exciting. Like I am having so much fun, but also this is the worst because I'm in a closeted relationship that I know that I can't publicly come out with. I can't share this love with the world. So like, it's the worst, but it's also the best. So we went on our way, too in love to think straight. Too in love? to think straight. That is a lyric that Taylor Swift wrote and then recorded and then released in the deluxe version of this album. Too in love to think straight. Please tell me a heterosexual explanation for too in love to think straight. Like to write that line on the same album that she's written a crooked love in a straight line down like she is screaming at us, like, please hear me, please hear what I'm trying to say here. I am too in love to think straight. Like she is too in love with this woman to think about straightness, to think about having to conform to society, to think about the sort of consequences of doing what she's doing. Like she is too in love to think straight. Taylor Swift is intentional with her lyrics. She knows how that's going to sound to a queer audience. This is just two albums before Lover in which she literally openly writes about queerness and gayness. Like she knows the queer community. She knows the gay community. And she writes this lyric and puts it in her song. But there were strangers watching and whispers turned to talking and talking turned to screams. This reminisces back to I know places where she's being hunted, she's being watched by people, she talks about whispers in that song and rumors, she is scared of rumors. Like she is so worried about the outside perception of her relationship. If she is in a straight relationship, like why does it matter? Why does it matter that people are watching her? Why does it matter that people are talking about their relationship? Because a lot of the time being the public eye, like you know that's gonna come with the territory of being a celebrity. Didn't it all seem new and exciting? I felt your arms twisting around me. It's all fun and games till somebody loses their mind. Somebody in this relationship couldn't cope with the sort of like analysis anymore, the rumours anymore, being in a potential closeted relationship anymore. It was all fun games up till that point and then it got very serious very quickly. I reached for you but you were gone. I knew I had to go back home so she knew she had to leave Wonderland. She had to leave this person who she very much associated with Wonderland. You searched the world for something else to make you feel like what we had and in the end in Wonderland we both went mad. I just have to say like that line, every time that line comes up in the song like it just 
it flows so nicely off the tongue. I love it. Um, in the end, in Wonderland, you both went mad. Again, homosexuality was considered a mental illness for many years. This relationship, having to hide their relationship, maybe sent them both mad. Um, it, this very much harked back to Hits Different for me. I very much feel like the vibe between those two songs, which is fantastic, because I think they might be two of my favourite Taylor Swift songs ever. We found Wonderland, you and I got lost in it, and we pretended it could last forever. This relationship, whatever it was, it couldn't last forever. They knew this going in because... Taylor Swift is not out. She could not be out in a queer relationship. And realistically, it wasn't going to work. It couldn't last forever. I just love that song with my whole entire heart. Like, is it too gay of me to actually get Too In Love To Think Straight tattooed instead? Maybe I could get Too In Love To Think Straight tattooed down my scoliosis spine. <laughs> Meta. <laughs> We're gonna really briefly touch on You Are In Love. Taylor has said publicly that this song is about Jack Antonoff and Lena Dunham. Do I want to believe this song is about Lena Dunham? Not particularly, but every time a song is quite like explicitly gay, Taylor does have to come out with some sort of like explanation. Like before the release of Lavender Haze, she had to like come out and be like, this is what this song is about. I promise you it's not gay. I promise you Lavender Haze, not gay. It's about man, I swear. Um, so I feel like only when is the song so explicitly queer does Taylor come out and like say the reasoning behind it. But that's just my own theory. I always found it weird that she said this song was about Jack and Lena because to me I've always sort of like listened to this through the lens of reminiscing about a past relationship. So not one that's currently ongoing but like a past relationship that hasn't worked out. And I was actually really pleased when I was doing a bit of research for this video. I came across some evidence this song was originally titled You Were In Love which makes so much sense. Like that completely makes sense with my understanding of this song. So I don't think she originally wrote it about Jack and Lena, but I think she maybe applied it to them after the fact. I don't really know. Um, this song I've written down screams lesbian. It screams being coy, scared to sort of like share this love with the world. This is one of the rare songs on 1989 where she does actually use he, him pronouns, small talk, he drives coffee at midnight. Um, he says, look up and your shoulders brush, blah, blah, blah. And one night he wakes, strange look on his face, pauses, then says, you're my best friend. I find the use of best friend really interesting. So again, that is a massive trope in just lesbianism, I suppose. Like people always assume that you are best friends with somebody you're actually in a relationship with. Like the amount of times me and my partner have got like, oh, you're such good friends or the worst. Oh, are you sisters? No. I feel like a lot of people, especially like older generations, feel more comfortable describing sapphic relationships as like best friendships rather than what they are, relationships, just because that is uncomfortable to them. And this also makes me think of Dress, which again, very inherently gay song of Taylor's, maybe Taylor's most explicitly queer song, personally. My fiance is not a gayla. She thinks I'm actually like a little bit mad. I wouldn't even say I'm a gayla. I just see the queer themes in Taylor's songs. Like I, I see them, but even she listens to dress and she's like, yeah, like this, this song is gay. <laughs> I did really want to talk about New Romantics today before Taylor's version comes out in two days time. And then I can just do the From the Vault tracks for the end of this video. But my camera is flashing at me. So I will see you for you, it'll be like that. For me, it'll be in like three days time to talk about New Romantics, which is very, very gay. She ended the album on a very gay song. Um, and the Vault tracks. I'm so excited. I can't believe I haven't heard them yet. And I will have done in like two, three days time. I'm so excited. And welcome to part three of this video where I'm going to round us off with my analysis of New Romantics and the five Vault tracks. The Vault tracks? are so good. Like, so good. I am so happy with all of them. We'll talk more about them in a second. Um, we're gonna start with New Romantics, which is just such an undeniably gay song. So I think before I delve into my analysis of New Romantics, we need to have a bit of an understanding of what the New Romantic movement was, because it wasn't just a random phrase that Taylor Swift came up with and wrote a song about. Like, New Romantic was, it was an entire era. Um, according to Wikipedia, the New Romantic movement was an underground subculture movement that originated in the United Kingdom in the late 1970s. The movement emerged from the nightclub scene in London and Birmingham at venues such as Billy's and The Blitz. This sort of subculture was influenced by the music 
music and the fashion of people like David Bowie, Mark Bolan, Roxy Music. Um, the New Romantics developed fashions inspired by the glam rock era, coupled with the early Romantic period of the late 18th and early 19th century, from which the movement took its name. Androgyny was a really big thing, like think men in lace and makeup, like really bright, bold makeup. You'd have women in suits and short hair, like gender bending was massive, think Boy George and Culture Club. Like I said, this was centered at a few clubs in sort of like London and Birmingham mostly. In London, there was a club called the Blitz Club and they would often literally turn people away at the door for like not dressing enough. The inspiration of the new romantic movement as a whole on 1989 is very clear, that whole sort of like synth poppy sound. But it was also undeniably really queer. Like this was probably the first time where queer men were up on stage singing about queer experiences, although not overtly, not blatantly, but a lot of the time it was about queer experiences. Like literally think David Bowie, Boy George, and it was going to the top of the charts, like in both the UK and the US. The new romantic movement did sort of slowly decline into the 1980s as new fashions took over, but the impact that it had, the fashion and the music is undeniable. I mean, just look at 1989, like it's a prime example. But I think that just adds some really interesting context to the song, even if you're not thinking about it from like the queer angle, the queer lens, it's fascinating to know why this song is called New Romantics and what that means. So the song starts off with, we're all bored, we're all so tired of everything, we wait for trains that just aren't coming. So Taylor is basically, she's bored, she's waiting for her life to really start. And then we move on to, we show off our different scarlet letters, trust me, mine is better. This is absolutely fascinating, hear me out. So a scarlet letter is a stigma that somebody bears for a sort of misdeed or a sin, and it comes from a book by Nathaniel Hawthorne from I think the 1850s, like somewhere in the 1800s. So here Taylor is saying that everyone is showing off their different scarlet letters. So they're different sins, they're different misdeeds, the things that they're hiding from the world. And she is like, let's all show off our scarlet letters. Like, trust me, I have the best one. Like I have the best scarlet letter that nobody's going to expect, but I have like the biggest sin. What is one of the biggest sins? Because I can assume that Taylor Swift hasn't murdered anyone. We're going to put that out there. I'm assuming she's not a murderer. Um, a pretty big scarlet letter could be the sin of homosexuality. We're so young, but we're on the road to ruin. We play dumb, but we know exactly what we're doing. So why is Taylor on the road to ruin? Like, they're young, but she's making decisions that she thinks are going to ruin her. We're on the road to ruin, and she's making those decisions with somebody else. We're on the road to ruin. And also, we play dumb. So again, she's making this decision with somebody else, and they're playing dumb, and like, people are asking questions. It's like, oh no, like, we're just friends, maybe. But we know exactly what we're doing. So we're denying the gay rumors. Like, we're playing dumb, but we know what we're doing. And we cry tears of mascara in the bathroom. Honey, life is just a classroom. So that, again, to me, it seems very like, welcome to New York. Like, you're learning things. You've got this new life ahead of you. Like, life's exciting. Like, Taylor wrote this album when she was in her early 20s. Like, you have so much exciting life ahead of you. And here's where it gets really interesting. Cause baby, I could build a castle out of all the bricks they threw at me. And every day is like a battle, but every night with us is like a dream. Cause baby, I could build a castle out of all the bricks they threw at me. The bricks. We've got rhubarb joining us for a bit. I'm sure she'll get bored in a second. But in my eyes, out of all the bricks they threw at me is a pretty overt Stonewall reference in which bricks were thrown at Stonewall. Like that's what started the riots. That's what started Pride as we know it today. And every day is like a battle and every night with us is like a dream. And that is the case in so many queer relationships. Every day when you're out there in the world, it's a battle to get people to take you seriously, to not be abused, to not be hate crimed at, I suppose. But every night when it's just the two of us, it's a dream because it's what you, it's who you are, it's what you truly want. Also, I suppose every night with us is like a dream. We could be talking about nightlife. New Romantics is very overtly referring to the London nightlife of this time, the queer London nightlife of this time, 1970s. So maybe she could be talking about like queer nightlife. Um, Baby, we're the New Romantics. So this is a song she's singing to somebody else, like me and you, we are the New Romantics. Heartbreak is the national anthem. We sing it proudly. I love the use of the word proud there, obviously referring to pride, being proud of who you are. 
And we're too busy dancing to get knocked off our feet. Baby, we're the new romantics. The best people in life are free. So we're too busy dancing to get knocked off our feet. Again, that could be another reference like queer nightlife. Again, new romantics is a clubbing culture. Taylor Swift, just such a clever writer. Like even if none of this is meant to be queer in the slightest, which I admit it might not be, but this is just how I view her music and I view these songs. Just the references, like, it's so clever. Like, New Romantics, and then she's singing about, like, clubbing and dancing, because that's what the New Romantic era was. It's so cool. Free, maybe, to love whoever they want, when they want. Like, they're happiest when they're free, maybe. And we're all here, the lights and noise are blinding. Again, clubbing, we hang back, it's all in the timing. It's poker, he can't see my face, but I'm about to play my ace. So again, I see this as Taylor is in a club, like, She's dancing with her friends and maybe somebody's come up to her and is trying to hit on her. It's poker, he can't see it in my face because it's dark, but I'm about to play my ace. Now this is really interesting So whenever Taylor sings about card games, I instantly think back to Cornelia Street and card sharks. Um, it's poker, he can't see it in my face, but I'm about to play my ace. What would an ace be for somebody like Taylor Swift when somebody's hitting on her? Rhubarb, come down here, you're being very rude. Um, it could be that, sorry, I'm gay, I'm about to play my, my ace, like, I can't, I'm not interested because I'm gay. We need love, but all we want is danger, again, all we want is danger, maybe she wants to come out and she wants to be living this out and proud life, but she knows it's dangerous, but also she wants it, and we team up and then switch sides like a record changer, I've seen some people say switch sides could be bisexuality, the rumours are terrible and cruel, but honey, most of them are true. So Taylor's got all these rumours out there about her at this time in her life. She's got the press saying all sorts of things. And there's also rumours at this time about her and Diane Agron. Like whether or not you believe that's a real thing, there were undeniably, the rumours were there. So she could be referring to those. Um, but honey, most of them are true. So she knows she's got all these rumours out there but most of them are true. The other biggest rumour about Taylor at this point in her life was just that she was a slut, which we'll be talking about in the next song, slut. Um, but she is outwardly saying like, that's not true, like I'm not a slut, like it's not wrong of me to like want to stay around and like be with people. But this rumour, the rumour that she's referring to here, well honey, most of them are true. It could also be in reference to rumours about most new romantic artists in this time, David Bowie, Boy George, Adam Ant. And then we move down to please take my hand and please take me dancing and please leave me stranded. It's so romantic, which to me, it just sounds so sarcastic. I don't really have much gay context for that. I just think that's so sarcastic and really funny. She's kind of like romanticizing the fact that none of her relationships are gonna go anywhere. Like she knows at the end of this, she's gonna be stranded because maybe she is queer. She can't come out for whatever reason or for some quite obvious reasons, I think. And so she's like, oh, let's romanticize the end of this relationship. Like, let's romanticize when you leave me stranded and I'm stuck, but we're gonna make the best out of it. This is genuinely one of Taylor's best songs ever. Like the subtext to this song is so genius. And I love how this is how she closes out, like her very, in my mind, explicitly queer album, like her first explicitly queer album. Like she ends it on the lines, Baby with the new romantics, the best people in life are free. Okay, let's talk vault tracks because I love these vault tracks so much. They give me such like 1989 slash Midnight's vibe, which I love. I love Midnight's as an album. Like I know some people really don't like Midnight's. I love it. As a pop girly, Midnight's, so good. And a lot of people are saying these vault tracks sound too much like Midnight's, so Taylor's lying about them being 1989 Volt tracks and said she's just taken rejects off Midnight's, put them on it. I don't believe any of that, but I do think Midnight's as an album is meant to be the kind of sister album to 1989 because their sound is inherently really similar anyway. And of course, Taylor wrote these Volt tracks back in 2014, 2013, whenever she wrote them, but she wouldn't have necessarily produced them at that point. So of course, them being produced now in 2022, maybe she did it, I don't know they would sound more similar to her current vibe than her 1989 vibe. Okay, I'll get off my pedestal, I just had to say that. Like, I will not hear Volt Track Slander for 1989. I'm not hearing it, or Midnight Slander. No, no. 
In terms of queerness though, like queer analysis of the vault tracks, I really don't have loads. I've been saying throughout this video, which I've filmed like over the course of a couple of weeks, that I don't believe in Harry Styles and Taylor. I think I said like in the first bit I filmed, like I love the idea of Harry and Taylor, but I do believe it's PR. I must admit the vault tracks have kind of like thrown a spanner in the works. I'm probably more on the side of it not being a PR relationship now than I was before. But also I still, I still don't fully believe, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but we are going to start the analysis with Slut, which by the way, one of the best song names ever. I must admit, with a name like that, I did expect to love the song more. I don't dislike the song, it's probably my least favourite though, of the Vault Tracks. Don't kill me. So to start our queer analysis of slut, I want to point out the fact that slut and bisexuality are often seen as kind of synonymous. I don't believe that, that is not a personal opinion. I identified personally as bisexual for many, many years, but a lot of people do think that bisexual people are inherently slutty because apparently it's slutty to like both genders, which is ridiculous. But if you're looking at it from a queer angle, that could be an interesting analysis to make. In this very first verse here, we have Taylor basically just like listing colours. We have flamingo pink, we have aquamarine. Later in the song, we have tangerine. Um, I think that could be interesting to look at in comparison to Out of the Woods, where she's saying the rest of the world was black and white, but we were in screaming colour. I made my analysis of that earlier in the video. Basically, screaming colour, pride, like the rainbow is there. <laughs> Taylor has said herself that this song is a play on discussions around her dating life at this time because she was relentlessly slut shamed for just dating multiple people like people in their early 20s and teenagers do tend to do. And the media absolutely took that and ran with it. Like Taylor was thought of as a slut for so many years. And so this was Taylor basically like taking that idea and putting it on its head and being like, if you're gonna call me a slut, then I might as well be like in love. Like if you're gonna do it, I might as well like do what you're saying I'm gonna do, but as long as I'm in love, I don't really care. She said the only reason this one didn't get put on the album is because she already had Blank Space, and Blank Space obviously was a very sort of similar vibe, similar idea, and this song feels very LA, whilst 1989 is her New York album, and obviously it is LA, like you've got Sunrise Boulevard, you've got, what else we've got, Handprints and Wet Men, obviously like the Walk of Stars, Walk of Stars, what is it called? <laughs> Walk of Stars? That sounds wrong. Am I thinking Walk of Shame? Hollywood Boulevard. I don't, you know what I'm trying to say. I did see a fantastic analysis of this. I think I saw it on Twitter or like threads or somewhere about how each verse in this song seems to be about a different muse. So Taylor's like, if you're gonna call me a slut then I'm gonna make a song in which each verse is about a different person and you're never gonna know who is who. Um, which I think I agree with, like I think that does make sense. Um, just from the way she's talking about the muses and sort of singing about their time together, they all do seem sort of different. We've got the line, love thorns all over this rose. Obviously roses are inherently very beautiful, like they're a symbol of beauty all around the world. But this rose is covered in thorns, like it's painful, it's gonna hurt. And again, maybe that could symbolize some sort of queerness because in the next line it says, I'll pay the price you won't. So whoever Taylor's in a relationship with or whoever, Taylor is sort of like seeing at this time, which is saying like, I'm gonna pay the price for this, like you won't. Which in the context of the song being about slut shaming, totally makes sense. I'm not trying to say it's not about that um, because she's gonna pay the price for, like she's gonna be the one called a slut and this other person, the guy, whoever it is, isn't gonna be because like he's a guy, they're allowed to do that. Whereas she will because she's her. But also you could say that maybe if she's in a relationship with a woman, somebody of the same sex, she's gonna pay the price for that. The other person will probably be able to like slip under the radar and have it forgotten about quite quickly, but Taylor isn't gonna have that luxury. Oh, and I also love the line, lovelorn and nobody knows. I looked up the definition of lovelorn and it's being very unhappy with an unrequited love, which doesn't make sense in the context of this song, I don't think, because she's talking about being slut shamed by the media for being in this relationship. But she's saying she's lovelorn. So she's got an unrequited love that she's very unhappy about, but nobody knows. Which is fascinating, don't you think? I love this verse where she says, everyone wants him, that was my crime, the wrong place at the right time. And I break down, then he's pulling me in. In a world of boys, he's a gentleman. Which I don't have much of a queer analysis for that. I just love those lines. I think they sound really good, but also they're really interesting. 
If I was to guess, I would say that is about Harry Styles. In a world of boys, he's a gentleman, he was in a boy band, he's surrounded by boys, but he is like the gentleman, he stands out. Um, everybody wants him, or everyone wants him, that was my crime. Obviously, everyone wants Harry Styles. I'm a lesbian. I want Harry Styles. I want him. I've always wanted him. I had, <laughs> I had a post come up on my Facebook from 13 years ago, like literally two days ago, and it was, I love Harry Styles. And that was when they were still on the X Factor. 13 years ago, I was tweeting about my love for Harry Styles and they were still on X Factor. You can't beat me, OG. You're not saying you're in love with me, but you're going to. I find that really interesting because this, this whole song sort of gives me the vibes of Cornelia Street. Obviously not that it sounds like Cornelia Street at all, but it's the same idea of like Taylor basically begging somebody to want her back and like begging for that love to be returned and somebody not being entirely sure, like somebody being like one foot out the door all the time. Um, half awake, taking your chances. It's a big mistake I said, it might blow up in your pretty face. The use of the word pretty is really, really interesting here. Again, it could be referring to Harry Styles because undeniably that's a very pretty man, especially back in this era. Um, but pretty is generally a word used to describe women rather than men handsome face would be more likely to be used for a man, whereas pretty, that's very feminine. Like I said, not loads of queer analysis, but a really interesting song to look at nonetheless. However, we do have a bit more to say when it comes to Say Don't Go. The opening lines, I've known it from the very start, we're a shot in the darkest dark. So straight from the get-go, Taylor is being like, this relationship isn't gonna work. <laughs> I know that, like I don't even need to like, try like it's not gonna work but we're gonna give it a shot anyway but it's not going to work why i'm unarmed the waiting is a sadness fading into madness that very much gives me wonderland vibes and in the end of wonderland we both went mad the next verse starts i'm standing on a tightrope alone which is really interesting when you think about it in terms of mirrorball in which she is saying i'm still on that tightrope i'm still trying everything to keep you laughing at me so taylor is basically like using the tightrope to be like, look at me, like, please love me. Like I'm here, I put myself in danger. I just want you to notice me. I hold my breath a little bit longer, halfway out the door, but it won't close. I'm holding out hope for you to say, don't go. I would stay forever if you say, don't go. So again, Taylor is begging for this other person to look at her and notice her and be like, oh, please don't go, stay with me. But this other person, they're not going to do that. Why do you have to lead me on? Why do you have to twist the knife? Walk away and leave me bleeding, bleeding. That kind of might call back to bad blood for me. Bad blood, everyone thinks is about Taylor's and Katy Perry's bad like friendship breakdown. Some people wonder if it could be about a platonic friendship that turned into more and then Taylor basically got stabbed in the back. Why do you whisper in the dark just to leave me in the night? I think this line is really interesting because again, it kind of calls back to Wonderland. Um, I've written here, I reached for you and you were gone is a very similar vibe. And also all you had to do was stay with why do you have to lock me out when I let you in? Now your silence has me screaming, screaming. So this is somebody that Taylor's let in and they have turned around and been like, no, and they've just sort of like ghosted her in a way. And it's the use of like, now your silence has me screaming. Whereas in You're In Love, she's like, you can hear it in the silence. Like when they're talking about love, she's like, I can hear your love in the silence. And now she's like, now that same silence has me screaming, it's painful. This person, whoever this is, is just not interested anymore. Cause you kiss me and it stops time and I'm yours, but you're not mine. It's really heartbreaking actually. Um, I'm standing on the sidewalk alone. I wait for you to drive by. I was trying to see the cards that you won't show. Again, talking about cards. She talked about cards or like playing her ace in slut. No, did she? Oh, I'm forgetting what I've mentioned. No, cards was new romantic. It was new romantic, wasn't it? Again, reference to card games. It seems to me like at first Taylor wasn't really interested in this muse and they put in the work to like make her like them. And then to them, maybe it was like a game. We all know people like that. I'm sure we've all had crushes on people who fought for us and fought for us and fought for us. And as soon as we've shown them attention and they've turned around and been like, oh, actually, no, I just enjoyed the game. Um, I'm sure everyone's got a story like that. If not, then it's just me and Taylor. Um, why do you have to give me nothing back? So once Taylor was interested, this person was like, no, sorry. Why do you have to make me love you? I said, I love you, you say nothing back. That is heartbreaking. 
maybe this person is just a bit of a playboy maybe they were just playing a game or it could be that this person was too scared to say i love you back too scared to make this into something real because it would have real life repercussions oh now that we don't talk is such an interesting one to analyze this song gives me such big mastermind vibes you know we were talking earlier about like 1989 and midnights being very like similar vibes this song is mastermind which i love because i love mastermind so this song is about a once important relationship that's now come to an end but also there are so many references to friendships and platonic relationships as well which instantly gets the gay bells ringing Honestly, to me, this song screams that you're in a relationship with somebody who's refusing to tell other people that you're in said relationship. So around all like their friends, you need to pretend to be like just platonic, your buddies, your best friends. And then one day you stop turning up because you and this person have broken up and everyone's wondering like, where's where's Taylor gone? Like, why does she hang out with us anymore? And obviously I do understand that some friendship breakups can be quite traumatic, quite traumatizing, I know from experience, but often you don't stop being friends with everyone else they're friends with as well. So this is a relationship in which Taylor has removed herself from an entire friendship group. You went to a party, I heard from everybody, so Taylor is hearing this after the fact from everyone else. You part the crowd like the Red Sea, don't even get me started. Did you get anxious though on the way home? I guess I'll never ever know now that we don't talk. Why is this person going to a party and then getting anxious on the way home? Could they maybe be hiding something? I remember I used to like go to social gatherings and try so hard <laughs> to like be straight and not let anything go, like especially when I was like, 17 18 years old like going to like sick form parties and i'd go home and i'd be so anxious that i'd said something that would make somebody think that i might not be straight and it used to like go around my head all the time one of my biggest like one of the craziest things that i have learned in adult life as a queer woman is how little straight people think about sexuality and that blew my mind because as a gay person my sexuality is on my mind like every second of every day like it's something i think about constantly and from speaking to other queer people like it's exactly the same for them like people are like oh people make being gay their personality but, like you kind of do because it's such a big part of your life it's, su it's something that you've really got to be aware of all the time to keep yourself safe um i can't remember where i was going with that did you get anxious so maybe this person was anxious about letting something slip maybe I guess I'll never ever know, now that we don't talk, so Taylor's already stopped speaking to this person. You grew your hair long. Again, she could be using Harry Styles as a sort of beard here because Harry did grow his hair long at some point after this. Long hair Harry, what an era. Um, but also that could be very much referring to a woman. You grew your hair long. Not many men grow their hair long. Um, and from the outside, it looks like you're trying lives on. So this person isn't very happy with their life. So they're trying all these different personalities to find where they might fit in. Maybe somebody who was trying to pass as straight, but I guess I don't have a say now that we don't talk. I called my mum, she said it was for the best. Remind myself the more I gave, you'd want me less. Um, this is very relevant to Say Don't Go. It's very much the same kind of vibe. Like the more interested you are in somebody, the less they're interested in you. Um, I cannot be your friend, so I pay the price of what I lost and what it costs now that we don't talk. I cannot be your friend. So you go through all this thinking like, oh, Taylor's singing about a romantic relationship. And now it's, I can't be your friend. So I pay the price of what I lost. Like, is Taylor or was Taylor in a relationship with somebody who was saying to her, like, we've just got to pretend to be friends. Like, when we're around people just be friends and taylor got to a point where she's like i can't do that anymore so i'm going to pay the price of what i lost i'm going to let you go and i'm going to hear about you from everyone else and people aren't going to be particularly sensitive because they don't realize the like relationship that we had but i can't be your friend like, i cannot be your friend anymore what do you tell your friends we share dinners long weekends with to me this is so damning because again there's no heterosexual explanation for this line if taylor was in a romantic relationship with somebody of the opposite sex why would they not have told his friends that they were in a relationship like why would it be a secret i'm sure there's some reasons why people might want to keep it a secret maybe but like in the context of this song just doesn't make sense. So Taylor's saying like, what do you tell your friends we share dinners and long weekends with? Like, why are you telling them that I'm not around anymore? And um, the truth is I can't pretend it's platonic, it's just ended. So I can't pretend it's platonic. 
she can't pretend that she's in a platonic relationship with this person because in her mind it's romantic. Why does this person want her to pretend that they are in a platonic friendship? I don't have to pretend I like acid rock or that I'd like to be on a mega yacht with important men who think important thoughts. Guess maybe I am better off now that we don't talk. So Taylor is now like got to a point where she's like made peace with it and she's thinking of all the things she didn't necessarily like about their relationship. She doesn't have to pretend that she likes acid rock, which I actually want to Google what acid rock is because I'm curious. Acid rock is a loosely defined type of rock music that evolved out of the mid 1960s garage punk movement and helped launch the psychedelic subculture. I I can't, <laughs> I have no idea which one of Taylor's muses would like acid rock to be honest. Um, or that I'd like to be on a mega yacht with important men who think important thoughts. This is very reminiscent of the man for me in which Taylor is basically saying like, if I was a man, you wouldn't criticize half the things that I did, but because I'm a woman, you criticize them. And the only way back to my dignity was to turn into a shrouded mystery. So this is Taylor being like, I let my heart out there, I'm bringing it back, I am now being a mysterious woman. Like, shrouded mystery, she's going back to hiding who she is, she's going back to hiding herself. Just like I had been when you were chasing me. So this person was chasing her, and she was like being all maybe like mysterious about her sexuality, and then eventually she let it slip, she let it out there. And now they have broken that trust that she put in them. So she's going back to being a mystery. And now they don't talk. Guess it has, guess this is how it has to be now that we don't talk. Considering this is only two minutes long, there is so much to analyze here. Suburban Legends as a song has no business being as wordy as it is. There are so many words here. Um, I've written here, this is about a relationship with somebody who isn't being entirely truthful. Maybe this person's cheating. At least that's kind of the vibe that I get here. Um, so we open with, you had people who called you on unmarked numbers in my peripheral vision. So straight away, it's like, I don't entri entirely trust this person. They're getting numbers and you're not telling me who's calling. I'm, I let it slide like a hose on a slippery plastic summer. <laughs> that line is so unhinged. I'm always quickly forgiven. You were so magnetic, it was almost obnoxious, flushed with the currency of cool. So straight up, I think Taylor is in a relationship here with somebody who is much cooler than her and she thinks is much cooler than her. You were so magnetic, it was almost obnoxious, flushed with the currency of cool. I was always turning out my empty pockets when it came to you. So she feels like kind of useless with this person, like even though she's Taylor Swift, like she felt like she was, she kind of had the lower hand, the lesser hand. What's the opposite of upper hand? Who knows, something. I didn't come here to make friends. So again, this could be a reference to whatever person she's talking about and now that we don't talk. I didn't come here to make friends. This is maybe a relationship with somebody who was assumed to be a friend or maybe that's how the relationship began, but that's not why she was in it to begin with, like she liked this person or at least like wanted to like this person. And we were born to be suburban legends. When you hold me, it holds me together. And you kiss me in a way that's going to screw me up forever. That line is so powerful. Have you ever been kissed by somebody and in that moment you've been like, oh fuck. <laughs> oh no, like bad things are gonna happen. And that is the way I felt the very first time I kissed a girl. Cause I was like, my life. <laughs> is never gonna be the same from this moment. Like I've well and truly screwed up here. Like you kiss me in a way that's going to screw me up forever. Like Taylor knows the gravity of being in a relationship with a woman. I had the fantasy that maybe our mismatched star signs, star signs, Taylor's talking about star signs, lesbian, um, would surprise our whole school when I ended up back at our class reunion, walking in with you. Taylor has this whole theme running through like a lot of her songs. The only song that's coming to my mind right now is Betty, in which she has this like schoolgirl fantasy, not in a sexual way that, don't Google that. Um, but she like talks a lot about like being in high school and like surprising people and like being a student still. You'd be more than a chapter in my old diary with the pages ripped out. So Taylor is writing about this person, like fantasizing about writing about this person, but she knows they cannot be read by anyone else. So she's writing and then just ripping the pages out because like, she's like, nobody can ever see this. I am standing in a 1950s gymnasium and I can still see you now. 1950s makes me straight away think of Lavender Hayes, that 1950s shit they want from me and that whole absurd, weird explanation that Taylor did on her Instagram page so weird. Um, also makes me think of the King Princess song, 1950s, which is like, 
outwardly gay, like that's a very gay song. Oh, also going back to the beginning of that verse, would surprise the whole school. So this is somebody that Taylor's with that is going to surprise the whole school that she's ended up with this person. She's kind of got this like fantasy of like bringing this person to like a high school reunion or something, like shocking the hell out of everyone. Um, again, it just reminds me of Betty. Like, kiss me on the porch in front of all your stupid friends. Betty, I don't care what you say, that song, in my soul, in my heart, is gay. Towards the end of the song we have I broke my own heart because you were too polite to do it. Not much to say about that, I just love that line. But it's like Taylor being like, I'm removing myself from this situation, from this relationship because you're being too polite, you're being too nice and I just need to get myself out. Waves crash, crash on the shore, I dash to the door, you don't knock anymore and my whole life's ruined. Whole life's ruined, that is very lesbian drama of her, like very much like dramatic. And our final song today is Is It Over Now? Like I said earlier, I always believed that Harry and Taylor was PR and this song is the thing that's made me question myself. But it's the blue dress on the boat line, like that line. <laughs> it threw me, it threw me for a loop, loop, I'm not gonna lie, but we're gonna go with it. We do know that Taylor does love to sprinkle in like misdirection in a lot of her songs. Like she'd be very clearly singing about a woman, like dress dress is so gay and then she does buzz cut and your hair bleached like really really that you like you know that was like tree pain being like this song is so gay like throw in something throw in something that's straight please i beg you <laughs> on a more serious note though like if taylor is queer if don't come for me if why would you go to the effort of bearding in real life if she's just gonna then like openly out herself in her music like that doesn't make like she wouldn't do that so it does make sense that in a lot of her songs which potentially are about women she will sprinkle in some things to like throw off the general public however i do want to say this is by far my favorite vault track this song is it's so good um i love how the beginning sounds like labyrinth i haven't quite thought about the connections between those two songs yet if there are even any connections so don't expect that kind of analysis from me um i also <laughs> love how much heat Harry's caught on the back of this song like people are like Harry's a cheater like have you seen have you seen that man have you seen that you think he's gonna settle with one woman even if it's Taylor Swift I don't think so um but also like Taylor is openly saying in this song as well like she also cheated like neither of them were faithful like Harry cheated Taylor cheated they weren't like it was never gonna work that's what the whole song is about so I don't understand why Harry's got so much flack for it to be honest like, baby, was it over when she laid down on your couch? Was it over when he unbuttoned my blouse? So yeah, Harry had girls lying down on his couch, but Taylor had other people unbuttoning her blouse. Like, neither of them were faithful here. Um, Come here, I whispered in your ear, in your dream as you passed out. Baby, was it over then? And is it over now? So this is an entire relationship which has been sort of like fraught with these sort of like cheating allegations, neither of them being able to be like 100% like honest with each other. And it's like, was it over then? Or is it over now? Like only as a result of this conversation? Like, or has it always been over? When You Lost Control, Red Blood, White Snow, a very obvious callback to Out of the Woods and the alleged snowmobile crash. Blue dress on a boat. I'm gonna put the photo up here now. That This is apparently Taylor escaping after a very like bad time with Harry. I'm not entirely sure of the lore on that one. Um, your new girl is my clone. Harry has a type, apparently. In this song, Taylor seems to be making it incredibly obvious who she's singing about, which kind of makes me think there is an underlayer of meaning here because Taylor is never this obvious. Like, is she just trying to deflect some of the attention? Like, it's so wildly obvious that it almost feels like too obvious for me, but then also maybe that is why these are the vault tracks and didn't make it onto the actual album back in 2014, maybe. And did you think I didn't see you? There were flashing lights. At least I had the decency to keep my nights out of sight. So whatever was going on in this relationship, I don't even know if they got to a point where they were like, they qualified their relationship as like a boyfriend girlfriend relationships. Clearly they were both like messing around with other people. Taylor's like, at least I had the decency to keep my nights out of sight. Like Harry might be her like muse publicly for most of 1989, but incredibly clearly from this song, she was seeing other people as well. There were more people in this era than Harry Styles, even if you're just like taking it at face value. Taylor was just like, at least I'm doing it on the down low. Like everyone knows what you're doing. 
there were only rumours about my hips and thighs, so obviously she could be referring to the slut sort of shaming rumours here. Oh lord, I think about jumping off of very tall some things just to see you come running and say the one thing I've been wanting, but no. This is very overdramatic of you, Taylor. <laughs> it's very overdramatic. But she's like, I want to like do something really extreme so you actually notice me, but she's like, I just feel like one in your like conveyor belt of girls, whereas I'm like really interested in you. Like I will drop everyone else if you come running to me and say the one thing I've been wanting, which might be I love you based on the other songs, who knows? Um, I just this song is so good. Um, let's fast forward to 300 awkward blind dates later. This bit of analysis I'm not going to claim for my own, I actually saw it on a TikTok video, which apparently I didn't like, so I can't find it again, so apologies. Um, but I saw somebody saying that the 300 awkward blind dates later is really interesting because Taylor Swift is not going on blind dates. She's not going on a single blind date, let alone 300 blind dates, like that is just not safe for her, like that is not safe at all. So the person I saw on TikTok was maybe saying that a whole relationship was 300 awkward blind dates. So it was the same blind date with the same person 300 times because it was a beading relationship. It was a PR relationship. It wasn't real. So they were all just awkward blind dates. I'm sure there is so much more I can say about this song and I'm sure as I listen to it over the coming weeks and I see more analysis online, I'm gonna be like, oh my God, how did I not see the song was much gayer than it was? But on face value, there's just not loads I can pick out of this song, but I love it. It's just such a good song. I don't care if it's gay, I don't care if it's straight. It's just so good. And I'm going to leave my analysis there. I think this video is probably gonna be about two hours long. So if you have stuck it out all the way to the end, then congratulations. I do just want to say a quick word at the end here about the prologue. Um, very famously, the prologue of 1989 has been going around the internet and people have been using it to attack Gaylers or people who suspect that Taylor may be queer flagging in her songs. And I have things to say. Um, in the prologue, Taylor says about not sexualizing her relationships, not sexualizing her friendships with women. Um, I would like to say, I'm not doing that. Most scalers aren't doing that. There is nothing, I'm not sexualizing anything that Taylor hasn't already put in her songs. Sexualization does not equal speculation. Like they're two very different things. Speculation about the queer flagging that is very blatantly there in a lot of Taylor's music. Like I don't understand how people wouldn't expect the queer community to pick up on these things. But of course straight people don't see these things because they don't know what queer flagging is. They don't pick up on it for a reason because they're not supposed to because it's supposed to flag to queer people. Sexualization is something entirely different. But hopefully my big old disclaimer at the beginning of this video was enough to stop any people jumping on me. Um, thank you so much for watching. I had loads of fun doing this. I love the album. It's just, I'm so happy that it's as good as the original because I was so scared. But no, it's wonderful, of course it is. I should never doubt Taylor. I've been listening to it on repeat. Is it over now? It's definitely my favorite vault track. Wonderland is still my favorite Taylor Swift song of all time, but the best re-record is I Know Places. Like that growl she does on We Run. Music, music to my ears, literally. Um, let me know if there's any other videos you want to see from me, whether the book video, Taylor Swift stuff, anything else you want to see, stick it in the comments, and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.